You know, people say I'm not interested in politics. Well, that may be the case, but it's very interested in you. And every decision from the water you brush your teeth with in the morning when you get up to um, the electricity that you switch off next to your bed at night has a politician or political process somewhere there that's determining that. How do we understand South Africa's ongoing political realignment and what role will some of the established opposition parties play in this inevitable political change? Well, joining me to discuss is John Steenhuizen. He is the leader of the Democratic Alliance and also the leader of the opposition in South Africa's parliament. John Steenhuizen, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, David, and great to be with all of those who are joining us. All right, so John, you've often spoken about the 2024 general elections as South Africa's moonshot election. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that it is um, the very first uh, election in over 75 years where there's a real potential where one party won't emerge with its own majority. Uh, if we look at the last local government election, the ANC lost its majority in a countrywide extrapolation of the results and they fell below 50% for the first time since democracy. Uh, and so I believe that there is a real prospect now that that no single party will have its outright majority after that election. And what this does is opens up a huge opportunity um, to affect change and to bring about a something new than the yoke of one partyism that has dominated South African politics for the last 75 years. Yeah, and in many respects, a lot of the problems that we're seeing at the political and social level are a symptom of the ANC's dominance. There's been a breakdown in accountability. Politicians are less likely to respond to issues on the ground. Uh, there's also some features of our political system that, that breaks down that, that accountability link. But now, what role do you see the DA playing there? Because you know, currently, the last elections, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're on about 20.22%, uh, I think, was the, the general elections. There's been a bit of a bump in the local government elections. ANC went down to 46% on aggregate across all of South Africa's municipalities in 2021. But, you know, there, there's a long way to go in terms of growth. What role do you see the DA playing in the kind of broader political mix there? So um, I think that what the... What the DA realistically needs to aim to do is to be the core of a new majority after the next election in 2024. It's an acknowledgement that it's highly unlikely we're going to get 51% of the vote. I mean, I'd love that. Um, but honestly, I don't believe that is attainable in this election cycle. Uh, but I do think what we can do is to get um, significantly upwards on 25 to 30%. And in a proportional representation system and a system where um, coalitions are the inevitable outcome of proportional representation systems, that is a significant chunk of votes. And it allows you to then be the core of a, of a new majority that will build and form a new government and to ensure then that your values and principles are brought to bear uh, within, that, within that particular environment. Um, and I think that's what the DA has got to do. We've got to go out and get as many chips as possible on the table so that when we have that high-stakes poker game after the election, that we're able to ensure that, that A, there's a, a, a majority around which we can coalesce and that it's our values and principles around which that, uh, that coalescence takes place. And when you refer to values and principles, what do you mean by that exactly? So the core fundamental values and principles, and I, and I think, and I, and I talk about values and principles because I think that if there's going to be a realignment in South African politics, it can only be and has to be around key values and principles. Uh, values and principles that people who may not be wearing the same color party T-shirt today, but believe in them. And there's four ones, uh, four of them that stand out for me as the core non-negotiable fundamental values and principles. Firstly, non-racialism, and that doesn't mean being blind to race. It means accepting that we don't regard people as envoys of their race and that we don't legislate in a way in which um, a way in which treats people as nothing more than a skin color. Um, secondly, a building a capable state, and that means getting rid of K to deployment, right-sizing the civil service, and ensuring that you have merit-based appointments into the civil service. And that's one of the reasons we've been fighting K to deployment as hard as we have. 
Thirdly, a social market economy, an economy that doesn't have a laissez-faire approach, it doesn't see the state as an actor. It sees the state as an actor, but the state's role must be confined specifically to those things that the state can do well, and it should leave everything else to the market and to the private sector to um, be able to drive uh, and to ensure, that, and then respect for the rule of law and the constitution. Uh, understanding that the values and principles enshrined in the Constitution, as well as in the Bill of Rights, uh, should be upheld, and that the principle of equality before the law must apply. I think that there are people within within a wide variety of political parties today who could find commonality around those values and principles, and I think that's the coalescence um, of the new majority that I've speak I've been speaking about, and the rational centre of South African politics can coalesce around those core foundational values, which I think would be essential for any new um, government or any new reform initiative to have at the heart of it. Right. Well, John, let's go through some of those principles. So first one, as you mentioned, is non-racialism. And actually in the Constitution, Section 1B, it talks about non-racialism as a foundational principle in the Constitution. And uh, that's something that's often overlooked, uh, particularly with the plethora of race-based laws that we have in South Africa. Um, but now we're recording on the 26th of October, which just happens to be uh, a couple of hours after Minister Gorongwana finished his medium-term budget policy statement. And in there, he outlined a, a policy update on uh, preferential Procurement. procurement policy. And, you know, I think there's, there's quite a backstory to that. We don't have time to go into it all today, but essentially the business group Saki Licha uh, basically took the government to court, the treasury to court that was... Uh, uh, Minister Gordon, who at the time was the minister, I think in 2016, 2017. And uh, basically the race-based preferential procurement policy was struck down by a court. Um, the, this has created a bit of a, a policy vacuum at the moment. And Minister Gonangwana said, well, uh, all government authorities can implement their own procurement policies uh, at, a, at their own discretion uh, until the kind of national policies are finalized. And now, obviously, the DA is in power in many municipalities and in the province of the Western Cape. Would you be able to commit yourself to merit-based appointments and uh, do away with some of these uh, racial criteria and, and perhaps potentially uh, face a legal challenge uh, against uh, the minister on that? Well, first of all, let me just say that, I mean, I think that uh, there is an opportunity now for, in light of that judgment, for South Africa to walk away from race-based policies which have clearly not served their purpose. Uh, if you look at what race-based policies have perpetrated on South Africa, well, they opened the door for cater deployment and state capture. Um, they've led to massive price gouging um, and an expense to ordinary citizens. Um, and they've seen huge amounts of money being siphoned off and there's been nothing broad-based or empowering to them. Black South African households are are significantly poorer and more unemployed than they were at the beginning of these processes. So the programs haven't worked. And I've often described you know, the race-based policies um, as trying to fix a gunshot wound by shooting the person again. You don't fix the problems and the legacy of race-based policies by putting more in. So yes, we already have, in, in some instances, in the Western Cape provincial government, moved uh, significantly away from slavish race-based appointments uh, as required by national legislation and introduced merit-based appointments. But I think there's a lot of scope for there to be, to do more. And um, I think that that certainly DA governments um, are going to be, become far more robust going forward around differentiating between DA governments and areas where the DA is in government and national government. And some of those key priorities have already started to happen uh, around things like electricity, like um, rail and policing, and, and you're going to see more uh, movement into those key levers that have been glassed off essentially from other governments going forward, because we have a duty to protect those who vote for us from the policy failings of the national government at a local and a, and a, and a provincial level. We've got to do something. You can't sit back, for instance, and say, well, the murder rate in Kyle Leach is X, but it's not our problem. It's Becky Taylor's problem because policing is a national function. No, those are Cape Tonians. Those are citizens who live in a DRN province. And so you've got to intervene and, and get in there and to start to 
uh, assume th uh, those powers. And I think that there's going to be a far more, I believe, confrontational approach going forward and a more assertiveness going forward, particularly as the state at a national level spins out of control and loses authority. And so the approach of the past has always been the one that followed the, the legal route and the intergovernmental dispute and the like. I think it's been far more successful. We've seen Mayor Hill Lewis, for instance, moving into the independent power producer space and saying to government, well, we're going to load shedding proof for our cities. You need to stop us if you if you want to, but then you must explain to voters why you don't want us to keep factories going and and why you don't want to keep the lights on. So I think there is a lot of scope. Um, and I also think that it's going to open up after the 2024 election where significantly, I think more provinces are going to fall to opposition coalitions or to other parties. And I think that it's going to give even more scope for, um, I think, um, a, a greater opportunity to differentiate um, in, in policy. But it's going to mean um, that those powers are pushed far more assertively than I think that they have been to date. Yeah, and we'll get into some of those devolution questions later in the conversation. But I think you do have the Constitution on your side. So Section 2172 yeah. uh, says that Subsection 1, uh, which I, I won't detail here, does not prevent the organs of state or institutions referred to in that subsection from implementing a procurement policy providing for uh, then Subsection B, the protection or advancement of persons or categories of persons. Uh, disadvantaged by unfair discrimination. So saying the constitution says you don't, we, we won't prevent you from having affirmative action policies, but that doesn't mean yeah. that you have to have them. And I, I mean, there's a number of other areas. I mean, around policing, for instance, they, Becky Taylor keeps citing that, you know, well, it's the constitution that doesn't allow us to devolve. Well, actually, that's not true. And we've pointed out in letters to him and to the president that the powers actually do exist for provinces to be play a bigger role in policing. And that, um, you know, it's not necessary that a constitutional amendment is going to be required for us to be able to keep citizens safe. All right. Well, John, in terms of the DA's identity and the role that it is seeking to play, I mean, would you describe the DA as a liberal party? What, what, is that, what does that term liberalism mean to you? Well, I certainly do think the DA in the South African context is the only liberal party that exists uh, in South Africa. And I think if you look at the core values and principles of the party, that they are liberal democratic principles. Um, and I think it was when the party started to move away from some of those core values and principles that it started to end up with uh, a bit of an identity crisis, particularly going into the 2019 election. Uh, and so I do think that if, if you look at the DA, um, it is, I, I would say, by all definitions, uh, a liberal party. Um, we're not a libertarian party, and there are different strains of liberalism within the DA that are reflected in, in different um, approaches to things. So you've got people who call themselves classic liberals, and you've got you've got others who um, you know have a different view on on certain things. But I would say that the, by far the overwhelming majority tradition within the DA is a liberal tradition. Um, uh, if you look at the at the constitution of the party, if you look at the value and principle set, these are all values and principles that are associated with the liberal democratic order um, around the world. All right. So now how does this play out in terms of the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of politics? Because it's all very well having uh, your ideals, but then there are inevitably going to be trade-offs, concessions that are going to be made, particularly with coalition partners. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see a potential tension there between the growth aspirations of the party and its desire to be in a coalition government at national provincial level and some of those core underlying values? So I think that if one looks at those core underlying values and principles, uh, they are what is used in guiding us in terms of coalition and coalition partners. So for instance, it would be very easy for us to solve the Johannesburg crisis by going into some form of arrangement with the economic freedom fighters, for instance. But there's a core recognition that the, their offer and their ideology is the antithesis of the liberal democratic uh, order and philosophy that it precludes us from actually doing deals with them. And I think that is as it should be. Um, I don't think that it is right for, for a party that believes in non-racialism 
to be in a coalition with a party that believes fundamentally in race-based nationalism. I don't believe that it is possible for a liberal democratic party that believes in a social market economy to be in a coalition with a party that believes in uh, in, in Marxism and, and sort of Chavez-style uh, approaches to the economy. And we saw what happens when you try that, and that was the 2016, what we call Coalition 1.0, where it showed very clearly that, that that cannot coexist, which is why we were able to go into this next election, this last one, and say we will not do any deals with the EFF because doing a deal with them is a betrayal of the core values and functions. Now, in any coalition, you've got to be flexible. There are things you're not always going to get your way. You're not always going to get the things one you want 100%. And that's a natural function of, of coalitions. But it cannot ever be at the cost of a betrayal of core values and principles. So on some of the issues of style and maybe some of the issues of approach, there's some areas of compromise. But once you compromise your core value set, um, it makes it incredibly difficult, I believe, to then differentiate yourself in government from governments that you would have replaced. And I think we experienced that very, very closely in 2016. And we learned some very important lessons from that. So the values and principles are the guiding force around who we do business with and how we do that business. Now, it's not an exact science, and we don't always get it right. And I think there are some issues, particularly where we get into government, and some decisions have to be made. And I know some, some people are often very critical of those. Um, but I would like to believe that if anyone looks at the a coalition and the coalition government where the DA is involved, by far the majority of the decisions being made, I think, are being made for the right reasons and using the right value set to make those decisions. Yeah, and one of the other tensions that might arise is that between the DA's principles of liberalism and majoritarian impulses. So yeah. maybe an example, the DA is one of the few parties that has a relatively open borders approach. I mean, you know, I think you see the value in immigration, particularly of, of skilled individuals. Um, and, you know, you could say that there's a cherished principle of individual freedom that people should be able to determine where they live, where they seek work. Um, but then potentially you could have coalition partners uh, that might be very anti-immigrant. So how would you uh, square that circle? Well, I, I mean, I think it would be, we, we would not be party to any decision that we believe um, would be would compromise core values of individual freedom and the like, uh, which is why we oppose xenophobia and the xenophobic violence that's broken out. But I don't believe that you can be that you necessarily, you know, as a liberal means that you're soft on on particularly illegal immigration. If you look at some of the more liberal countries in the world, New Zealand, Canada, and the like, uh, they've got very strong border control. So I think you can be tough on illegal immigration, and I think that you know there's a, a a need to be tough on illegal immigration. But there's a that's a completely different thing from scapegoating um, vulnerable groups of people in a country and trying to blame them for everything that's gone wrong in that country. And that's why you know I've called people like Herman Mashaba and others out on the xenophobic violence, and that's not how leaders behave. Uh, leaders try their very best to bring people together, not to divide them. And I think it's it's appalling to pick on a group of people who many of these populist politicians know don't have a vote. So they can attack them without any repercussion. And often this has a deadly consequence. I just want to unpack that term populism. Uh, that's mm -hmm. often used, in my view, as a way to kind of smear uh, political movements, particularly of the right and the center right. Uh, and, you know, you never hear, for example, uh, someone like Justin Trudeau being called a populist, but, uh, you know, Donald just Trump or Boris Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, are you equally disparaging about this idea of, of populism or are you using the term selectively as some of the people in the West? Yes, of course. And I mean, I made the point in a recent podcast that I was on is that, you know, everyone's jumping up and down about the election in Italy. Um, and you had the European Union uh, president saying they've got their ways and means of dealing with these things, etc. Um, the point I made was that was a democratic outcome um, of, of a democratic process. And you didn't see the same vehemence and anger when people like 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or uh, as Justin Trudeau or others are, are elected into positions in their countries where, you know, I think that their their radicalism and populism um, is is just as bad as, as anything that, you know, others are doing. Um, and that, you know, the point I made in that interview was that, you know, we, we should be trying to find the, the, the rational center and, and locating ourselves there. But I do think it's a smear that's used against people who you just simply disagree with. Um, but, I mean, I do believe whipping a population against a particular group or class of people is a form of populism that I think is unhealthy in an environment, particularly one like South Africa. Yeah, I think in many respects, one of the positive points that a lot of the so-called populists make is the dominance of supranational institutions, uh, global financial institutions, maybe. I think obviously you have to be realistic. We, in a global world, everyone is interconnected. But many of these large multi-state bureaucracies are actually subverting the sovereignty of, of nations. Correct. And there's an interesting tension there. And, yes. you know, I think if you look particularly during the pandemic, a lot of these uh, international organizations like the WHO, uh, for example, a lot of people are very critical of the World Economic Forum, which isn't even really a state actor, it's kind of more of a private platform. Uh, you know, I think there is some credit to uh, and some merit to those arguments that uh, they, they actually subvert the, the democratic process. Uh, well, not only do they subvert the democratic process, I think they often cause damage. And let's use the examples of lockdowns. Now, you know, the World um, Health Organization and many of those international bodies um, you know, were the ones that cited lockdown as the way to go. Um, obviously, when the pandemic broke out, you know, everybody realized and this was new territory for a lot of people. But it was very obvious to me after the second week of lockdown that this was not something that would work in the African and certainly not the South African context. Because it's very easy to go and, you know, if you're living in the Netherlands, to go and fill your freezer with food and put on your Netflix and, and self-isolate in a home for an extended period. That's not the reality on the ground if you're living in an informal settlement or um, a low-cost housing development where you can just simply stay indoors and where you know, most days are spent hustling just to be able to put food on the table. And so I think those one-size-fits-all approaches caused huge damage to, to, the, uh, to the economy like like South Africa's. But then again, of course, we you know, we went and exacerbated it by layering stupid socialism over it, which you know, saw things like the ban on cooked chickens, this ridiculous alcohol ban and and the like, which I think greatly exacerbated it. But you know, it, it was frustrating when you know we were trying to talk about you know, talk against lockdowns and you know why we had to end the lockdown and start focusing on living with the virus and, and managing it better, a better, in a better way, um, that you had constantly had the WHO and the science being shoved down your throat and said, oh, but, you know, we're just following what the WHO said. Yeah, well, it might, it might be what they've said, but in the South African context, is it going to work for us? And I think that's, I think that's the filter that, that you've got to use when you have these multinational organizations. And some of them do good work and, and some of them, I think, may be well-meaning. But I think what you, should, what you should be doing with that information is always verifying it against, A, the sovereignty of your own country. Are you surrendering the sovereignty of your own country? But B, is this something that's going to work in the context of our situation here in South Africa, uh, which is very different to what it would be in the Netherlands or Denmark or Sweden? Well, let's get back to domestic politics now uh, and the, the topic of the day. Uh, you know, I, I think there's great hope and uh, my colleagues and I have been advancing the thesis of the wild dogs, which is you know, the pack of coalition uh, groups that could bring down the aging buffalo of the ANC. Uh, but, you know, the numbers aren't exactly a done deal. You know, I think they need to be a huge swing away from the ANC. Um, and it would also require all of these multiple parties coordinating strategically and uh, having a common shared vision about the, the future. Um, but, you know, if we look at the last few weeks, Action SA and the DA have been tearing themselves apart. The Patriotic Alliance is uh, flip-flopping from uh, one party to the other in terms of its support. 
Uh, and, you know, it's just very unruly, as Helen Ziller has pointed out. Uh, so how do we stabilize these coalition governments? Because maybe the electorate is looking at all of this and thinking, sure, this is very volatile. I'm not sure that this is the way to go. Well, I mean, the first thing I would I would say to that is, I mean, yes, it is volatile, but any new uh, birth, uh, you know, has, you know, has its, its, its tough times. And I think we are finding each other across the spectrum. But also, I mean, you mustn't forget, I think there's over 38 coalitions around the country. And many of the majority of them work perfectly fine. I mean, there's obviously ones where you have a specific dynamic. And yes, I think it has been unfortunate, the manner in which some coalition partners have adopted uh, in those particular coalition agreements. And you know, I don't want to go back into the whole, you know, the fact, fact that when I sign a deal, I regard that deal as binding. And, you know, and unless the deal is renegotiated, that you don't just change things on the whim. And I think that's what was that was very frustrating. I think that there are some of the parties in the coalition that need to decide what they want. And if I may direct myself, particularly at a party like Action South Africa, mm. I think there's a sense of schizophrenia that is set in there where they don't know whether they're, primary job is to destroy the DA or it's to bring the ANC below 50%. And so you have this, this tension that then develops because uh, they don't want to see the DA seem to be succeeding on one hand, but then they also don't want to be allowing the ANC in, you know, on the other hand. And I think it leads to the, the schizophrenic behavior that we've seen uh, even just yesterday where you know, when the court case that uh, reinstated in Port Palazzi was announced, they put out a statement saying the ball's in the DA's court now to reach out to the other parties. And, you know, that process had already begun. And then there was a statement saying, no, well, we're going into opposition and we're going to be in our own to a position a few hours later saying, well, the DA must reach out. So it's, it, it is a schizophrenia that is frustrating. Um, obviously, I believe that you know, we need to have a greater level of political maturity to make these work. But as I said, I do think it is early, early days. And I think that coalitions 2.0 are already far better than the coalitions 1.0 that we'd had um, after the 2016 local government elections where a number of lessons were learned. Um, and so, you know, I think that is going to be some growing pains and parties are going to have to find each other. And I think there's going to have to be an element of, a far more political maturity going forward to make sure that we're able to demonstrate that these are viable alternatives to the um, one-party government. Yeah, I often quote Antonio Gramsci on the show where he said that the old is dying, but the new cannot yet be born. And in this yeah. interregnum, a variety of morbid symptoms appear. We certainly have a lot of morbid symptoms at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the Action SA, you know, if they were joining us today, would say, well, now, the DA is very arrogant in the way that it conducts itself in these coalition uh, discussions. Uh, do you think that's an unfair criticism? I absolutely think it's an unfair criticism, and I think it's a very convenient scapegoat for you to do it. And obviously, the bigger party in, in a coalition is always going to uh, you know, be subject to that. Um, the reality is there have been three major compromises, and I serve on the coalition oversight group where the leaders come together, there have been three major compromises that have had to be made over the course of the last six to eight months. All three of those have come from the DA side. I don't think it's arrogant to expect partners who sign a deal with you on their own volition and under no duress whatsoever um, to expect them to abide by that particular agreement. I, I, think that's, uh, I, I think that's to be expected. I think it is arrogant to believe that you can just walk away from a deal that you signed uh, a few months before, uh, because now suddenly it no longer suits your narrative or uh, or, or what you want to achieve. Um, so I, I reject the notion that the DA is arrogant. Um, I do, however, think that there needs to be an understanding that in a coalition, yes, there are a number of players, but there are parties that have brought more seats to the table uh, than others. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a CDU-led coalition in Germany or one of the others in the Nordic state, there is a bigger party. Always. And, um, you know, that that party is entitled to, I believe, a, um, more say because they've bought more shares to the table. It's the same as a, a shareholders meeting um, in for a, for a corporate. 
you know, you, a major shareholder has definitely got more say than a than a, a single shareholder. Um, and I don't think it's arrogant to you know to to expect people to abide by their agreements. And I think there's been a lot of give and take. And I think that um, the DA has made a lot of concessions. Um, and uh, I think it's an unfair analysis to call us arrogant. Right. You mentioned Germany, and they currently have the robots coalition, the the traffic yeah. light coalition, as they would call it, uh, the yeah. Greens, uh, the Liberal Democrats, and the Social Democrats. Uh, but now in Germany, they have thresholds. So you need, I think it's 5% of support in the Bundestag in order to uh, to have a seat there. Uh, but in South Africa, we have this plethora of small parties, and Helen Zilla has been quite critical saying that they are effectively kingmakers that can bring a whole coalition tumbling down and that introduces the checkbook politics, as I think you've, you've mentioned before. Uh, so, you know, do you think that that is something that would be suitable to the South African context? Or I do think it's going to be critical as we go forward now and we move into a coalition uh, environment. And a, a proportional representation system like South Africa will all to always ultimately end up in some coalition uh, eventually. And um, I think we're now in that reality. I do think we should be looking at putting thresholds in for precisely those reasons, that you end up with a party that got comma three, two percent of the vote that can essentially decide whether a government falls or stands. And I don't think that that is right. Um, and I think that we should look at thresholds. We've proposed a threshold of between 1% to 2% uh, in uh, some private members' legislation that we're busy working on in Parliament, but also to look at ways in which we can facilitate coalitions in the legislative environment that we have uh, at the moment. Uh, so, for instance, you, you've literally got 21 days after the election to elect the president. That's not enough time. I mean, look at that German example. I think it took six months to negotiate that coalition. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think that the system at the moment doesn't allow for a proper and considered coalition uh, negotiation to take place and, and for an agreement to come out. And I think it's going to, it's going to cause some rush things. So thresholds and um, I, I think um, some legislative changes are going to be required to facilitate healthier, more stable coalitions going forward. And might not that risk violating the principle of proportionality? I mean, the Constitution does say proportional in general, uh, yeah. but, you know, there could be a, a criticism there that that might undermine the votes that have been cast uh, to those small parties. Yeah, well, I would think that that it, you know, you, you're going to lose on the swings and gain on the roundabouts. So I think there will be a price to pay for having thresholds. But I think that the benefits, I think, will outweigh uh, any of those particular costs. And I mean, the, there's some places that have thresholds of up to eight to ten percent. I don't think it's I, I don't think it's unrealistic to expect somebody who could potentially be a party that ends up being in government to have a, at least one percent of the vote uh, in order to to reflect that. So I think there will be definitely some constraints on absolute proportionality but i think the long-term benefits of the stability that it will bring particularly when it comes to national and provincial government i think is important and i think that's something we mustn't lose sight of yes the instability in joburg is terrible but can you imagine if that was the finance minister that fell and and you know in the midst of us trying to attract investment in south africa and some small party pulled out of government and collapsed the entire government and now you're trying to, you know, to rescue things at a national level. I, I, I think that that it's not something that that our economic situation could afford uh, at this particular uh, juncture. So I do think we need to find a way to stabilise it at a national level, uh, so that we prevent us ending up with in a situation like Italy, where the government changes more often than the tide. Um, I think they've got the luxury of having a far more advanced economy and a growing economy. We don't, we don't have that. We're in deep financial trouble here in South Africa. And and I, I think instability will be an enemy of progress and growth rather than an ally. I had Bill Johnson on the show, and one of the proposals that he's made is for the opposition to unite and form a, a united front, as he called it. Uh, you know, one of the problems with that, I imagine, is that it's very difficult to determine how much electoral support parties will have before an election. Would you be in support of 
in support of a policy like that? No, and it doesn't work um, either. Um, and I'll give you an example of how it doesn't work. In 1999, uh, we formed what we called the Coalition for Change with the Encarta Freedom Party and KwaZulu Natal, where we formed an electoral pact going ahead of the election. And all it did was suppress, through a very clever campaign run by the ANC, I might add, DP voters who were told that the, DA, the DP would support moving the capital from Peter Maritzburg to Ulundi. And they repeated the campaign on the other side, saying that the IFP is going to take Ulundi and, and make Peter Maritzburg the capital. And what ended up happening in that situation is both parties' vote share went down, not up. So I think what you have to do is to find a way where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And if you can get that right, then I think it can work. But uh, my experience is that I think that given the niche votes that are voting blocks that exist in South Africa, that it is better for parties to go out and bring their chips onto the table and as much as they can, and to then put those together in, in a pot afterwards to try and, um, you know, try and and do it. I mean, um, I mean, Bill Johnson's an academic and... Um, I don't think he's ever been a politician. Uh, and so uh, I think it's very easy to theorize about these things. It's a lot harder to you know, just say to a party, well, just pack it in. Also, I think that he underestimates in making that particular suggestion, the power of the brand in South Africa. Um, South Africans are very brand loyal and, and brands matter. I don't think that with, with 17 months to go, between now and the next election, that you're going to be able to establish a brand with sufficient traction and time to be able to achieve what what what, what he imagines would be possible. Yeah, and many of these new entrants into the political scene, uh, some of whom are familiar faces, uh, others entirely new, uh, they're going to have a very challenging time trying to build a brand and a, and a platform uh, ahead of the 2024 elections. But no, correct. Uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, ask I me, mean, so well, why did you guys do a rebranding exercise of the DA? It's too late. I mean, you need to be branding three to four years out from an election at the minimum. And you're right. I mean, people like, you know, there's, there's this new, the new media darling, uh, like Songeza Zibi, for instance, is going to find it very difficult. And they're going to learn a very important lesson. And that's Twitter is not the voters role. And, you know, you may have X number of Twitters and follow, followers on, on Twitter. It doesn't necessarily translate into votes. And also, the party machinery that is built up over years and years of work on the ground, the branches, who's going to knock on the door and deliver your pamphlets in, in a community? Who's going to be hosting the meetings? Who's going to be doing um, the, you know, the, the public activism? That requires a huge machine. And people underestimate the importance of that machine uh, when it comes to turning out voters and, and elections. And I think there is a naivety that exists among some of these new entrants who are, who are promising an on marsh moment in South Africa that I'm afraid is, it's not going to materialize. And yes, you may you know, win a seat or two in parliament, but what then? What do you do then? You're sitting at the back of a, of a parliamentary chamber where you can speak in every third debate for maybe two minutes and maybe every fourth time the president's in parliament, you can ask him a question um, that you, you're you one person who's now got to cover 38 different portfolio committees in parliament. It's not that easy. Politics is a numbers game. And if you want to succeed, you've got to get the numbers and you've got to get the votes in the bag. And, and that's what it comes down to. Mampela Rampela uh, discovered this in 2014 when Hung only got a couple of seats. She didn't even take up her seat and very soon left the party. But I did interview Songhez Zibi on the show, and one of the questions I put to him was, you know, why didn't you join an established entity like the DA or the Action SA? And he seemed a little bit reticent to do that. I've often wondered, why is the DA not able to attract some of these personalities and, and you know, let them do the hard yards going, building their brand within the party and then, you know, ascending to a leadership position? Is that an ego well, problem? Is it, is it No, not at all. It? It's, I, I mean, and, and the example that you're using is somebody who I sat with on a veranda and made that exact point to them. Um, why don't you come and join us and build a brand and you know, make some great speeches in parliament and, uh, and you know, then you just, let's see what happens in the next election. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, I think that people underestimate how 
much work goes into running and managing a political organization. And everybody thinks that it's it's easy. It's not. It's uh, I spent the majority of my day begging for money, managing internal discipline and, you know, trying to keep the party, you know, moving in, in one direction. It's a full time job. And it's not an easy one by any stretch of the imagination. And politics is expensive, as I'm sure many of these people are going to to find out uh, you know, through through this experience. Um, are we, are, have we been able to attract? I think we've attracted great people into the DA. I think that there's, uh, I think even greater people than than the ones in which you've that you've spoken about. I look particularly at at my national spokesperson Solly Malazzi, who I think is uh, one of the uh, most incredibly gifted political communicators. I look at my chief whip in parliament, Saviwe Guarube, who I think is at an excellent grasp of the rules and, and is able to, to do that. I look at uh, people like Dr. Mimi Gondwe, who uh, joined us uh, because she felt that the DA was um, the way to go um, going forward and has joined us and is doing an excellent job in parliament. And I mean, I'm not going to do a call out list of, of every black public representative in the DA, but the DA is attracting talent. And we've got a, a specific talent acquisition process that we go through as well, uh, mainly through our young leaders program, which goes out every year to find South Africans, young South Africans across the spectrum, who we believe you know would benefit from an accelerated year's training. And and come into the and, and bring them into the orbit, and and that's how we do it. Um, as I say, you know, Songhez is a great guy, and and no doubt he means well, but he's going to discover that sitting at the back of a, a you know of a of a chamber where you know you don't have the support, you don't have the time, you don't have the ability to be able to say what you want to say. Um, he's going to find it's a, it's a very difficult environment to to navigate and that if you want to be you know make a difference you've got to be able to be part of a of a bigger team that's able to really bring that heft uh, to bear all right well say the da leads a coalition and takes over the reins in pretoria uh, the state is in a really dire condition at the moment it's been incapacitated you talk about wanting to build a capable state but yeah. uh, you know the, the level of decay is so extreme are you even able to do that Will you even be able to affect your agenda, given the state of the civil service, for example? Um, yes, I do believe we would be able to, but it would require some really tough choices to be made almost immediately. And those tough choices um, are around key things like the size of the cabinet, the size of the civil service, all of the key fundamental things that should have been reformed, but where the can has been kicked down the road. And I think what Ramaphosa is now reaping is the fact that he kicked the can down the road for far too long. And it's now reached a point where he can't do it with credibility anymore. So the best time to make those tough decisions, I believe, is straight after an election. And that's one of the things I'll never forgive Ramaphosa for. I mean, he was at one stage the most powerful politician um, the country's seen in a long time, where he had the opposition's voters and donors voting for him and giving him money and would have been able to speak to the country over his party. And yet he squandered that opportunity. So I think there are some tough choices that we have to make up front. Otherwise, you're going to be tinkering around the edges. And that's why South Africa is not growing. It's why unemployment is climbing. It's why economic opportunity is drying up, because nobody is, you know, believes anymore that the reform agenda is necessary. Right-sizing the civil service, overhauling the education system, reducing the size of government in South Africa, and bringing in merit-based appointments into the civil service to build a capable state that can then deliver on your policies. You can have the best policies in the world. If you don't have the machinery of state to implement those, then they remain as much of the ANC's agenda and much of the president's agenda remain words on paper at the union buildings. So I think that that a new government coming in, making those tough choices up front. And I look at, for instance, what the coalition government was able to do in Great Britain when uh, David Cameron and, and Nick Clegg came in. Um, you know, they came in and were honest with the British people that there were some tough cuts and choices that need to be made. And yes, there was going to be short-term pain, but that it would start to yield a, a longer-term results. And I think that any new government that's serious about changing South Africa for the better is going to have to have that honest conversation with South Africa the moment they're elected and saying, look, we've got to do these things and there's going to be some pain. But if we don't do these things, 
the longer term prospects are just going to wither on the vine and uh, we're going to continue on the downward trajectory. So I look at, for instance, what we were able to do in just such a short space in a place like Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, after six months of DA government, it went from being the second worst metro in the country to do business with to the second best behind Cape Town. Property prices went up. Uh, investment had gone up by 3 to 4%, all just based really on, on the sentiment that there was a new government in place that was doing the things that needed to be done. And I, I think that that's what's going to be required uh, if we were to get into government in some form or the other is to make those tough choices and, and to be honest with people about what the prospects were. I think it's going to take five to 10 years of solid policy reform and changes before you start to see the, the green shoots that are going to be required. But if we don't embark upon that, I think that the, the alternative is a failed state with greater poverty and, and inequality and, and tougher choices for more South Africans. But as the ANC faces more challenges at the ballot box and its political legitimacy starts to, to falter, you're going to see temptations to introduce pork barrel uh, spending, uh, the basic income grant, for example. So say, I mean, notwithstanding the minister's remarks today that there will be difficult trade-offs and he doesn't want any increase in in revenue collection to fund a basic income grant, but say the ANC implements a BIG in February 2023, uh, would yeah. would the DA have the courage to face the electorate and say, well, no, sorry, we, we actually have to scrap this because simply cannot afford it? We've already told the public that you know we can't afford it. It's it's just not affordable. You'll blow South Africa's balance sheet out completely, and and now that you've put Eskom's debt onto the books of South Africa to government's debtors book, you've you've got no wiggle room to left, uh, left to move anymore. I mean, debt servicing costs now are going to crowd out the social spend, and that is the reality. And that the, there is no substitute for advancement that beats a job, a, a good permanent job. And, you know, we, we really know what the recipe is to, to create those. But, I mean, I, government just doesn't have the money to do that. Uh, I think they would love to have done it already uh, if they could, but they don't have the money to do that. Um, and there's a number of things that we've suggested in this MTBPS that you could have done rather than you know dangling a, a basic income grant, and that's things like reducing the burdens on uh, on poor people, particularly by uh, putting more, more um, bas- uh, items into the VAT-free basket, particularly protein like bone and chicken. Uh, and just relieving that burden on poor households because you can't leave the poor just to fend for themselves. They require government in many instances to intervene. But to do so in a way that brings genuine relief rather than creating dependency uh, on government going forward. And we warned at the time the, the, the SRD grant, you know, there's nothing more, there's nothing more permanent in government than a temporary solution. And you know, the government's now got themselves into a situation where they just simply cannot withdraw that grant uh, because they know that there'll be social unrest. And that comes, I believe, as a function of not being honest with the people who you represent. And that sometimes government means having to tell people tough things. Um, and that is that, you know, we've got five to 10 years of, of really tough times ahead of us. But if we don't tighten the belt, if we don't rein in the spending, and if we don't focus on growing the economy and become a jobs-obsessed country, then the prospects are far worse. So the DA is not the only party that is contemplating a coalition future. The NC itself might be having to face this new reality. And they're going to be looking around, depending on if they fall below 50%, which I think is, is credible to think that they will. Should we be concerned about the ANC potentially throwing in their lot with the EFF? The EFF's been making noises in support of the ANC in, in respects yeah. recently. Look, um, I, I think it is a prospect, and I think it's a prospect that should terrify all of us because, you know, that's the, the exact opposite of what I call the rational centre coalescing. Uh, you then have the, the radical left coalescing. And I think the pathway and end result of that story is already written in places like Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and other places around the world where those policies have been there. I think it will be disastrous. If I look at just how much the EFF has been able to extract from the ANC from the opposition benches, dragging them down the rabbit holes of expropriation without compensation, 
um, the nationalization of the Reserve Bank uh, prescribed assets, um, imagine what would they be able to extract if they were in coalition. There is a recognition and, you know, political parties talk and politicians talk. There is a recognition, however, that that would amount to a reverse takeover of the ANC by the EFF. And the Ramaphosa faction are very aware of the fact that if that happened, it would be a matter of months before they were purged and were pushed out. So um, I, I think that it would be a reverse takeover of, of the ANC. And I think there are people in the ANC who understand that and would want to prevent that from, from taking place. Um, so I think it's also important to how far the ANC falls below 50%, because I think the temptation, if they end up with 49%, would be to just keep a co-opted good or um, Al Jamar or the PA or one of these other small parties that help prop them up. I think they need to fall significantly below the the 46% uh, mark down, down to the lower 40s, because that's then going to force their hand into making a choice finally about which parties they they decide that they would be prepared to work with um, going forward. But um, I, I think the worst case scenario for us is the ANC with a 49% outcome and they just co-opt one of these small, you know, near-do-well parties to, to, to keep themselves in government. Imagine it's 2024 and you're at the offices of the Electoral Commission, the results are coming in, and Mr. Ramaphosa, assuming he's still at the helm of the party by then, it says to you, well, you know, John, uh, I'm a bit worried because the numbers are not on our side. It looks like we're going to have to go into a coalition with the EFF, but you know, alternatively, we could go into a coalition with the DA. How would you respond in that situation? Well, I think we'd have to we'd have to respond seriously and in a mature way and in a, in a way that would put the country first rather than narrow party politics first. As I said to you, I think it would be disastrous for the country if the EFF and the ANC were to find each other, uh, because I think that we would be very much put on the fast forward slope there. However, there is a caveat. What would that look like? And what what would it would it be? And would it be with the ANC in its current configuration? Or would it be with some faction of the ANC? Because I think what you have to do is be very careful as well and not make the same mistake that the MDC did, um, when essentially what they did was despite the fact that they did well in the election, they were forced into a compromise with the with ZANU-PF. And ZANU-PF ended up you know, just extending their life off the back of the MDC's credibility there. So f- to my mind, it would be a very tough bargain that would have to take place for us to do a deal with them. And it would mean the ANC abandoning things like cater deployment, uh, abandoning um, many of the members of their own organization who are corrupt, and committing to a program of action that focused on driving the reform agenda. Um, and I think I think that, as I said, I think there are people in the ANC, I think there are people in, in a lot of the parties that I think we can do business with, but it would have to be on the basis of a shared program of action and shared values and principles, rather than just the expedience of, of trying to, you know, uh, to get into government. Um, that that there would have to be a serious commitment to a reform agenda, um, and that would have to be reduced to writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that the worst outcome for South Africa, the the, the sort of end game is EFF ANC, and I think that as rational centrists and and people who believe in the rational centre, we should be doing everything we can to prove to prevent that from happening. And that's one of the reasons why we don't want to go into government with the EFF, because we don't want to give them a shred of credibility that this is a party that you can trust in government to be able to do what's right, because our experience shows us that it's quite the opposite. And how do you think DA voters would respond to that? Because in many respects, DA's, a lot of its identity is based on an anti-ANC platform. Well, I, mean, I don't think that the DA's identity is based on anti-ANC. I think that we've got an alternative po- program of action and an alternative policy. And I think we've demonstrated where we govern that we have an alternative way of doing things that actually works. And the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town and Midval municipality are examples of that. Look, I think it would be have to it would depend very much on, on what situation we were facing and how bad things were. 
I think things are going to get very bad between now and the next election. If I look at today's MTBPS, um, I'm not seeing a government that has a plan to pull us out of the dive. And I think things are about to get a lot harder for a lot more South Africans. And I think by the time the election rolls around, I think people are going to be looking far more for a way out of the mess and looking for solutions than they are going to be looking to around ideology or, you know, finger pointing. And so, uh, you know, I think, as I said, it's a, it's something the DA is going to have to take very, very seriously on board. But, and, and it's going to be a matter of, well, what is in the best interest of South Africa and the best interest of South Africans? Um, is it better to just let the radicals take control and the devil take the hindmost? Or, you know, do you put some chips on the table and some skin in the game and say, well, you know, let's let's try and fix it. Um, and the voters will will eventually have to decide. And uh, I hope that they would they would err on the side of of wanting to save South Africa and and do what's right by South Africa. Um, and as I said, I think things are going to be so bad by the time that election rolls around that that parties that indulge in just the finger pointing, I think, are going to get punished. People are going to want to see solutions and alternatives. Yeah, and as in my discussion with Paul Johnson. The prospect of an EFF ANC coalition would drive the political momentum for secessionist movements, which up until quite recently seemed like quite a remote scenario. But now we have quite a serious Cape independence movement, and the DA itself has also uh, joined this political devolution working group. Not all of the participants of that working group have the same objectives, uh, but they do have a shared interest in seeing more devolution of power more decentralization, which is a big theme of this show, incidentally. So yeah. why did the DA join this group? What are you hoping to get out of it? So, I mean, if you look at, at, at the DAs, and again, go back to our core foundational values and principles and our, our constitution, subsidiarity and federalism are, are key tenets of that. Uh, we believe in devolving power as far as possible to as local a level as possible, because we believe that... You know, brings um, scales, better scale, it brings better accountability, more transparency, and it gives people greater control of their lives. Uh, and so that's always been a, a, DA, um, a, a DA policy. Um, what we've seen um, over the last one, and, and let me be clear, um, I believe that, and this is a point we've made with many of those people, is that I believe that what we need in South Africa is to build an ecosystem of change. And that any political party that steps up at a podium and says to you, we are the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way, uh, is misleading you. Um, quite the opposite. And what's what, so we've adopted very purposely what we call the whole of society approach. And what that approach does is it recognizes that there are different players across the spectrum. And that if one looks at the change environment in South Africa, that brought about democracy, although the ANC liked to tell us it was the ANC alone who liberated South Africa, it wasn't. There was NUSAS, there was the Serbian Council of Churches, there was organized business, there was labor trade unions, um, there was uh, Kusatu, um, there was the, you know, the uh, Congress movement, etc. And what they did, what they were very good at doing is the ANC was building that ecosystem of change and then using it to, to bring the change. I think that if we want to change South Africa, we've got to rebuild the ecosystem of change. And that means bringing organizations in from civil society, whether it's a Black Business Forum, whether it's AFRI Forum, whether it's Solidaritat, whether it's any one of these, Sakalicha, it's about bringing people together around a common set of objectives and principles. And devolution, to my mind, is one of the only ways we're going to start to fix things in South Africa. This notion that Pretoria will provide has never worked. It didn't work under the Nats. It's not working under the ANC. And that if you want to see real genuine service delivery, that it involves then taking power away from the center and devolving it to the area where it is best performed and best able to, to function. And in South Africa's instance, We've not only made the ideological argument, we've demonstrated that that is the case, which is why places like Cape Town are able to avoid one level of load shedding uh, from the rest of the country, because locally it is easier to produce and plug independent power into the grid and, and to do it more nimbly. We've shown it now with policing, um, the uh, reducing crime from, uh, from Inyanga 
from being one of the, the murder hotspots in the country to out of the top 10 because of a localized approach to policing through the LEAP program. So it's, I think more and more South Africans are going to realize that if they want things to work, that they're going to have to, we're going to have to take power away from the incompetent state and give it back to those spheres and levels where it is best able to, to ensure delivery. One of the reasons we don't have an integrated transport system in South Africa is that transport is, is separated across three different functions. How do you consolidate to create a, a seamless transport system when you've got some of the systems sitting in local government, some at province and some at national, and a turf war that breaks out continuously? It's a little wonder we don't have trains running and that we don't have a seamless transfer between the taxi system, the bus system, and the train system uh, in, in, in our cities. So I think we've got to... I think it's why we've joined this this group and why we've called people together is we believe that where people have a common objective, and I don't believe in secession of the Western Cape, I, and I, I've been very clear about that. But I have said that can we sit with organizations that agree with us that devolving more power to provinces and to local government is going to improve service delivery? Uh, I will absolutely sit with them, um, and I will sit with anybody who who shares that view and believes that in, in that and wants to fight for that because uh, I, I fundamentally believe that is the way for the future in South Africa, that that this notion that Pretoria is going to come to the rescue on this white horse uh, is, is fanciful, outdated, and has been disproved time and time again. Yeah, and in many ways we have this fig leaf of federalism. It's not genuine yeah. federalism. I think one of the, the big obstacles is that you as a province – don't have revenue generating capabilities. 95% of your funding comes from national treasury. There's also these shared competencies, health, education. Is there not room there for pushing to acquire more powers for the province uh, from national? Yes, funding? and it's, it's, it's underway at the moment. But just to, just to go back to the, the first uh, uh, issue, Rez, you're absolutely right. So you win a, a thumping majority in a province and you arrive in the office on the day and they say, right, this is the engine room. These are all the levers you know, that you can use now to drive the economy, to, you know, to do what you want to do. But these ones here are glassed off because they're nationals. You can't and Treasury them. has the keys. Yeah. And, and they've got the keys. And some of these are fundamental, like policing, like transport, like harbors. And how do you grow the Eastern Cape's agricultural economy when you've got fruit rotting at the quayside because you've got an inefficient state that cannot run a, a harbor system properly and get your products to market? So it's, um, it's, it's just madness. And um, you will see a far more assertive role now being played as the state starts to fail more and more at a national level, where we're just stepping in now and saying, right, we're not asking anymore. We're going to do these things. And you must now go and stop us. So if you don't want us to keep the lights on in Cape Town, you must go and explain to a judge why you would like us to implement load shedding and kill jobs and and and, and kill, kill economic growth. You can go and explain to them. We're not going to go and beg you anymore to do it. And the same with policing. You know, we're not we're tired of begging you and showing you that the police to population ratio in places like Google are amongst the worst in the world. We are going to step in now and and put police personnel into these areas because we're going to fight crime. And if you don't want us to keep people safe, well, you go and tell a judge why you don't believe the people in Google Air 2 should be kept safe. And I think that that, that, that this assertiveness, uh, once it starts to get the confidence of people, particularly, I think you're going to see it um, gathering momentum. Because, ironically, it is, I believe, the way in which future government is going to happen in South Africa. There's a very real prospect that there will be many more provinces, you know, governed by different people. Who knows? The ANC could be governing provinces, but not governing at a national level. Um, you know, so they should be getting behind this uh, this federalism because it would mean then that the national government wouldn't be able to meddle in in the way in which they run their provinces, um, and uh, they could resist the open opportunity society and all its benefits uh, for their province. Um, so, you know, I think that that the system lends itself to greater provincial autonomy. We have the nine provinces. Let's stop treating them as maps and, and pieces of paper and start giving them real powers. And I generally believe once it happens, that's when you're really going to unleash 
economic growth and advancement and I think good healthy competition between provinces as well around attracting investment and businesses and jobs into that particular environment, which doesn't exist at the moment. So John, many people watching this conversation will have heard your words that things are going to get worse. And, uh, you know, this has been a very political discussion, but what can ordinary South Africans do to prepare for some of the risks that might be emerging in our very volatile system and contributing to, to the necessary change in South Africa? So I think that the first thing that people need to understand is that, that it's not possible anymore. It's a luxury that people can't afford in South Africa to be passive about what is happening and that you have to be involved at some level. And I'm not saying rush out and you know form a political party or join a political party, although we'd love to have any South African who wants to help build the future. But for goodness sake, do something, whether it's a service club, whether it's a, a local branch of AFRI Forum, whether it's your Chamber of Commerce, whether it's Sakelecha, just get involved somewhere and start trying to make a difference. Because the days of just sitting back and saying, well, you know, it's not working, you know, I'll just worry about my little patch are over. Service delivery failure is going to reach into every home uh, and to every corner of South Africa if we don't stand together and, and do something. Secondly, make sure that you register to vote because things ain't going to change if you don't vote. And, you know, people say, I'm not interested in politics. Well, that may be the case, but it's very interested in you. And every decision from the water you brush your teeth with in the morning when you get up to um, the electricity that you switch off next to your bed at night has a politician or political process somewhere there that's determining that. Make sure you register to vote and make sure you vote in this next election. Don't sit it out and say, well, you know, hopefully the next election, you know, it'll be a better prospect. Um, I'm calling this a moonshot election because it is the one chance we've had in a very long time where the ANC at their weakest, um, some polls have them within 13 to 15% of the opposition. Um, let's not waste the opportunity. But my key message is get involved. Just do something. Um, with, with, you know, Whether it's local, whether it's provincial, whether you're doing something nationally, just do something because we need now more than ever the best of South Africans to come to the fore now and to start to stand together because things are about to get really real here in South Africa. And I mean, I, I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell your, the viewers, this, the very people who are struggling under the weight of spiraling food costs, fuel costs that are going through the roof, who are wondering how on earth they're going to be able to afford to educate their children uh, and wondering what their prospects are. Um, things are getting real and we can bring change. We can do so within the next 18 months, but it's going to come up to active citizens, not passive uh, recipients of, of services. Well, John Stian Hazen, I think this is a reminder that South Africa is worth fighting for and I certainly look forward to watching our politics and the DA's role in that in the run-up to 2024. But I just wanted to thank you very, very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, David. It's been great to be with you and I look forward to continuing these engagements as we as we march forward to that next election. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Also leave your thoughts down in the comment section. If you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.